Okay, so this was the puzzle. Dude, what the fuck? What is up my disciples, Coding Jesus here. If you're new to this channel, welcome. My name is Coding Jesus. I'm a quantitative developer, meaning I write server and client-side applications for traders at the firm that I work at. Now this video is a highly requested video. It is a video about how to solve quantitative puzzles, but more specifically, how to solve Jane Street puzzles. Now I'm going to be looking at Jane Street puzzles as the basis for this video, but all the tips and tricks I will be giving you guys as to how to solve quantitative puzzles based off my own experience are going to be applicable to all quantitative puzzles. Whether that's a puzzle you get in the interview or a puzzle you get by simply looking at puzzles online, all these tips will be applicable. Now, why am I uniquely positioned to talk about this? Well, in 2020, I was Jane Street's number one puzzle solver. What does that mean? What the hell is Jane Street? How does that work? Well, Jane Street's a very highly respected firm in the quantitative trading space. They are a large firm and every month they will post one puzzle. What the f is that? They will give people that month to solve that puzzle. I'm assuming they receive thousands, if not tens of thousands of submissions. And the people that answer that puzzle correctly, they get one chance, get their name on the leaderboard. When I say that I've solved these puzzles, you can go ahead and check. My name is on all those leaderboards. Alrighty guys, without further ado, let's get into my four to five tips as to how I go about approaching quantitative puzzles in specific reference to Jane Street puzzles. The first thing you need to understand is your toolkit. What's available to you? What skills do you possess or not possess? All right, many people maybe watching this video are great at linguistics. Maybe some people are great at math. Maybe some people are great at programming. Now, one of the major misconceptions when it comes to quantitative puzzles is that they are all focused on math and you have to be some sort of math genius. Guys, I am not a math genius. My highest qualification in math is a second year statistics course. I am not a math genius and I did not use math for the vast majority of these puzzles. In fact, many quantitative puzzles focus on things above and beyond math. What? like spatial reasoning to oh, go ahead and solve puzzles. In fact, one of the hardest puzzles that I've solved, which we will get to maybe later in this video, is a puzzle focused on chess. All right, so you need to understand what's in your toolkit. My personal toolkit, my strength is programming. I'm not a good mathematician. I'm okay at spatial reasoning. So when I think of what I can use to solve puzzles, programming immediately jumps out in my toolkit. Now let's actually now take a look at a Jane Street puzzle that I solved, the first Jane Street puzzle that, I, puzzle that I solved, and think about it in terms of programming. My worked solutions, Jane Street puzzles, my worked solution, so my answers for all the puzzles that I've solved, I'm going to right now be talking about the October 2019 puzzle called Try Try Again Again. So if you look at the try try again again .cpp, this is where I detailed my approach, I detailed the classes that I have, the different methods, what I did to speed up the solution, slow down the solution, and I will also have on the top right hand side of the screen a video showing you my algorithm in action. While that's playing, let's go ahead and find that puzzle in the Jane Street Puzzle Archive. It is try try again again. If we go to the solution tab, as you can see, my name is right here alongside the, what is this? 30 to 50 other people that also solved this puzzle. Let's take a look at what the puzzle is to better understand it in, in the context of understanding your own personal toolkit. Okay, so this was the puzzle. Dude, what the fuck? You had some sort of board here, and I'm not going to go into an hour long explanation as to what I did, so bear with me. But let's first read what the puzzle is so we can understand what sort of tools one can use to solve this. Place a collection of right triangles into the grid below. The triangles must have integer length legs and the legs must be along grid lengths or grid lines, meaning they can't poke out of these grid lines. They have to be maintained in this grid. Each triangle must contain exactly one number. That number represents the area of the triangle containing it. Every number must eventually be contained in exactly one triangle. So I can't have more than one triangle containing the same number and I can't have two numbers or two or more numbers in one triangle. The entire square, so the entire one by one cell containing the number must be inside the triangle. So this number 14, for example, I can't have a triangle's edge grazing this 14. The 14 must be entirely inside a triangle. Triangle interiors must not overlap, but triangle boundaries may intersect as seen in this example. Uh, as you answer, as your answer to this month's puzzle, please send in the product of the odd horizontal leg lengths. 
All right, so here's an example with a smaller grid. Now, when I looked at this puzzle, I needed to think of my own personal toolkit. It's empty. My toolkit involves programming, maybe a bit of math, maybe a bit of spatial reasoning. I could have taken the spatial reasoning route here and started to draw triangles, but the sheer amount of triangle combinations here are just so vast that my ability to reason this spatially just isn't strong enough. Now, I'm not gonna go into exactly every single line of code that I wrote for this problem. You can just go ahead and see it here. I documented it in its entirety. Um, and so you can go ahead and actually take a look at my code here, how I was actually able to cut the runtime in half as well, etc., etc. This brings me to the next point that I wanna talk about, and that is understanding your own personal strengths and weaknesses. When it comes to solving a puzzle, especially if the puzzle is in an interview setting, you need to understand what you're good at and what you're not good at and be extremely self-aware in that respect. Oftentimes, we try to tackle a problem all by ourselves. And when we tackle a problem by ourselves, we hit a stone wall because we don't have the skills required to actually progress in solving this puzzle. Now, I'm a person that's resourceful and I like to use my resources and leverage my resources when it comes to solving puzzles where I arrive at barriers that I cannot cross. What does that mean? Well, if a puzzle requires a higher degree of spatial reasoning, I might, for example, jot down my current approach and ask on a forum online, for example, if somebody else is stronger than spatial reasoning with me, can you help me in passing this barrier? This is my current approach, this is my current thinking, this is where I'm stuck, this is where I can, I think I can improve on with somebody else's help. And in fact, if you go on Jane Street's website and look at the leaderboards, a lot of people submit answers with the group of people that they've solved that puzzle with. So oftentimes, you will be solving these problems with a group of people because you will be playing off each other's strengths. This brings me to the third point that I would like to discuss, and that is perseverance. Now, I can't teach you perseverance. I can't tell you how to persevere. Perseverance is most likely something that you were born with and that was solidified by the time that you were 12. In fact, there's a very interesting study that I'd like to show you guys about perseverance. Do Asian kids embrace struggle in learning and American kids give up, right? So, study conducted by a professor at UCLA, uh, the differences between how East and West approach experience of intellectual struggle. He observed how Japanese, uh, how in a Japanese classrooms, teachers consciously design tasks that were slightly beyond the capability of the students they teach and actively point out that students accomplish tasks through work, sorry, through hard work and struggle. In the US, the focus is, mo is more on intelligence as an acquired skill. All right, so this paraphrases the study. So we did a study many years ago with first grade students. We decided to go out and give the students an impossible math problem to work on. Then we would measure how long they worked on it before they gave up. The American students worked on it less than 30 seconds on average and then basically looked at us and said, we haven't had this, so I've never seen this before. And guys, in all the quant puzzles that I've solved, I've never seen them before, right? So imagine me giving up halfway through eventually solving that puzzle, right? That would have sucked a lot. But the Japanese students worked for the entire hour on the impossible problem. And finally, we had to stop the session because the hour was up, and then we had to debrief them and say, oh, that was not a possible problem. That was an impossible problem. And they looked at us like, what kind of animals are we? Right? So there's a very big difference in learning through struggle and learning from simply relying on acquired knowledge or acquired skill. And oftentimes, while you might rely on bits and pieces of acquired skills in quant problems, oftentimes the biggest driver is acquisition through struggle and in acquiring intelligence through struggle. This brings me to my fourth point, guys. The fourth thing that I want to talk about in terms of how to solve quant-based puzzles. And this is spatial reasoning. All right. Oftentimes when you're given a puzzle, it's either given an esoteric wording Bruh. or it's given with components that involve moving and manipulating objects in your head. When it comes to increasing spatial reasoning, it is very difficult, but it is not impossible. The way that I think I trained spatial reasoning for myself, especially when I was growing up around, you know, 15, 16, is I would solve Rubik's Cubes. And I'd start with a 2x2 two two Rubik's Cube and work to a 3x3, three 5x5, three, five five, and at home I even had a 12x12 12 12 Rubik's Cube. Now by the time I got to a 12x12 12 12 Rubik's Cube, I already knew in general how to solve Rubik's Cubes, the certain patterns involved. But try something simple. Try a 2x2 two two Rubik's Cube, 
Don't try the one by one Rubik's cube. Okay, try the two by two Rubik's cube and try to solve it. Try to go ahead and move it and manipulate it because when you're trying to solve a problem using spatial reasoning, you need to think of various paths ahead of time and how they will look like when you go about solving a problem. And in fact, people that play chess and that are that play chess at a high level have a very, very high level of spatial reasoning because they need to think of multiple scenarios in their head, not only relative to what they will do, but relative to what the other person will do. Let's take a look at a Jane Street puzzle that involved spatial reasoning where I can walk you through how I reasoned through this puzzle. Alrighty guys, this is the puzzle. June 2020 puzzle. Call a ring, a circles of circles, a collection of six circles of equal radius. Dude, I don't get it. I don't get it either. Ring, 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 ring. Say R, whose centers lie on the six vertices of a regular hexagon with side lengths 2R. This makes each circle tangent to its two neighbors, and we can call the center of the regular hexagon the center of the ring of circles. If we are given a circle C, what is the maximum proportion of the area of the circle we can cover with rings of circles entirely contained within C that are all mutually disjoint and share the same center? What? All right, when submitting an answer, you can either send in a closed form solution or your answer out to six decimal places. There's a lot of bits and pieces here, but this involves spatial reasoning because in particular, you need to draw out what the question's even saying for you to understand what the question is. All right, this needs to be a drawing, either on paper or in your head, that you need to make out. Some people that are mathematical uh, whiz kids will submit a closed form solution, okay? Because they have a background in math. That's not part of my toolkit. I'm gonna submit a, a uh, code-based answer, and I'm gonna get there by writing code, and I'm gonna need to submit it to six decimal places. Now you guys, once again, can take a look at my code here. This is code from what is over a year, a year ago now. So I don't really remember exactly my entire solution. So spatial awareness for me here was key to drawing truths to simplify the problem dramatically. Alrighty guys, that's the end of the video. Thanks for watching it. If you did enjoy it, if you found it a little useful, make sure to give me a thumbs up. If you didn't enjoy it, hey, give me a thumbs down. That still counts for engagement and that still helps me boost my channel. Subscribe if you like this, share it with your friends that are interested in these puzzles. As I said, all my solutions are available online. If you'd like to support this channel, consider becoming a patron. Patreon link in the description box below. And guys, if you'd like to join this community, Discord link in the description box below. If you wanna book me one-on-one, -on -one, if you'd like to talk to me, Calendly link in the description box below. And if you'd like to email me, whether you want to marry me, divorce me, you hate me, you love me, go ahead and send me an email at thecodingjesus at codingjesus.com. Thanks for watching this video, guys. Cheers.